opening the door to the building of the third Jewish temple. Some called it a kiss from heaven. After the destruction of the first and second temples, Christians always waited for the day when the temple of God would once again appear before their eyes. The construction of the third temple in Jerusalem holds immense significance in biblical prophecy. It represents the return of Jesus Christ to earth and the continuation of the sacred Jewish tradition. However, the journey towards its completion is fraught with political and religious tensions because the alleged location of the third temple is extremely sensitive, which is the Dome of the Rock, a holy site that Muslims believe is, is theirs. After a long wait, the construction of the third temple finally shows signs of starting. Many people are extremely happy and ready to wait for the return of this sacred symbol. But before everyone could enjoy this moment, some strange events happened that shocked everyone. I invite you to see what happens when the third temple is rebuilt. The Ark of the Covenant is nearby. For religious people, the temple is really important. It symbolized God's presence among his people through the Ark of the Covenant, which was kept in the temple. It was the place where God revealed himself many times. The temple was a symbol of national security because God's children believed that the temple would never be destroyed. The tabernacle became the first temple. Then the Ark of the Covenant disappeared, but it will probably return when the third temple is formed. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and the Ark of his Covenant was seen within his temple there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Following the Bible, the temple in heaven opened, and he saw the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. In Old Testament times, the Ark symbolized God's presence. It contained the tablets of the law, an urn of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. The Ark disappeared during the exile, but it never lost its significance. The Ark's appearance in heaven indicates that God's presence and protection continue for his people. Wars and earthly calamities cannot destroy the Ark's significance. Similarly, no power on earth can rob believers of the presence and protection of their Lord. God wants to be among his people. The sanctuary would remain as a spiritual guide for the Israelites for many generations, including its successor, the Temple in Jerusalem. For God to be willing to make his home amongst his people would be a sign of honor. He didn't do so out of necessity, but rather out of choice. He wants to live amongst his people whom he had delivered from Egypt. He wants this covenant between him and Israel to work out. The Antichrist as Temple Builder Bible prophecy associates the Antichrist with the rebuilding of the third temple. You can see these verses in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 to 12. Here we see that the third temple will definitely be rebuilt, but it will be a place for the worship of the Antichrist. The mystery of iniquity has been operating for 2,000 years, and this is the devil's program to place his man on the throne of the world. Thus, there are two spiritual programs operating in the world today during the church age. God's program of world evangelism and the calling out of a people for his name among all nations and the devil's program to resist God's work and to bring in the Antichrist. There is one that withholds the devil's program. We believe that this is the Holy Spirit who came from heaven on the day of Pentecost to empower the churches for worldwide evangelism. Thus, as long as it is God's will to continue saving Gentiles and building the churches, the devil cannot bring his plan to fruition. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. Subscribe and also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. Alright, 
Let's keep rolling. God is in ultimate control. Daniel says the timing of the Antichrist's work is appointed and determined. It will not happen until God allows it to happen. The time will come when the restrainer will be taken out of the way, and then the Antichrist will be revealed. This refers to the rapture of church-age saints. The Holy Spirit is the omnipresent God, and in that sense He is everywhere at all times. But in another sense, He came into the world at Pentecost to perform a particular work, and He will depart at the rapture when that work is accomplished. The Antichrist's appearance will be accompanied both by satanic deception and by strong delusion sent by God as a judgment upon those who reject the truth. Those who think they can wait until these events begin to happen and get saved at that time are foolish. Those who have heard and rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ will be blinded. Note that God does not blind arbitrarily. He blinds those who reject the truth. Every human was a choice. Christ gives light to every man. The Antichrist's appearance will be accompanied by miracles. This will be part of the satanic deception. There will be signs and lying wonders. The Jews demanded a sign. You can see this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. And though Christ performed mighty miracles by the power of God, they rejected him. The Antichrist and his false prophet will perform lying wonders by the power of Satan, and the Jews will receive him. Every mention of miracles at the end of the church age pertains to satanic miracles. See also Matthew chapter 24 verse 24 and Revelation chapter 13 verses 11 to 15. When the Antichrist comes, he will appear to be a sincere man who wants to help the world. He will not appear to be a monster. He will have a powerful personality with more charisma than any ruler that has preceded him in history. He will be an astounding orator speaking great things. He will be bold and authoritative. He will be a master of intrigue and have an astonishing ability to solve age-old problems. But it will be a lie. After three and a half years, he will show his true nature and his peace program will bring sudden destruction in the form of the greatest time of trouble the world has ever seen. At this time, the Great Tribulation will begin. The Antichrist will show his satanic hatred of the Jews and will begin to persecute them. Thus, Jesus warns them to flee to the mountains. God doesn't want a temple. Although it has clearly shown the importance of the temple and the desire of Christians to rebuild the temple as a place to worship God. But you know, this is not exactly what God wants. God says that he doesn't want a temple. He wants obedience and righteousness. You can see this in Isaiah chapter 66 verses 1 to 2. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Since the temple will be built by Christ rejecting Jews who are in rebellion to God's word, their sacrifices are not acceptable. This mentioned in verse 3. They might as well sacrifice a dog as a lamb because they rejected the Lamb of God. There is no place in the Bible God instructed that Christ or his disciples should build a church. Rather, Christ commanded his disciples to preach the gospel everywhere. Let's take a look at these verses. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. 
Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Actually, God's will is not a physical temple. He needs a spiritual temple, but it must be a temple. That is when all those who believe in God dedicate their most holy hearts to hope and worship him. God does not want his children to frantically rebuild the temple, but in fact, in their hearts, there is no presence of God. The previous temples and tabernacles were built with hands. After much sacrifice, the presence of God will dwell therein. But after the sacrifice of Christ, the temple of God is now in our spirit, which is not built with hands. The disciples are to preach the gospel everywhere they went, mark its place, place of worship, and when those who believe, accept Jesus, will invite them over to their home, where they will continue to preach God's word. Christ is the temple, and so we are. God is the temple for the believer. Believers in God, in Christ who has reconciled us, are in him. As Christians, we are the temple of God. In the Old Testament, God Almighty established with the priesthood how the house of God should be built, as this was where his spirit would dwell on the earth. This mentioned in Exodus 25. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, the Apostle Paul hit on the true nature of the church as the body of Christ when he asked, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. We are the temple of God means that we, Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, who are joined together in one family as the church, are a holy dwelling place for God's presence. So when Paul said, you are the temple of God. He was referring to the believers as a group, the local church. The temple in Jerusalem was a sacred building dedicated to the worship of God. According to Paul, the church was the equivalent of the temple. God's presence resided in the church, and the church was to maintain holiness. From humanity's beginning, God has desired to live among and commune with his people. As the Israelites wandered in the desert, God wanted to inhabit a place with his people. At that time, the people lived in portable tents, so the presence of God dwelled in the tent of the wilderness tabernacle. His presence was the guiding force that told the people when to stay put and when to pull up stakes and continue on their journey. Later, after the Hebrew people entered the Promised Land and lived in fixed dwellings, God affixed his name to a place, sanctifying Solomon's temple as the Lord's holy dwelling place. In the New Testament, God's presence was manifested in a new way, in the person of Jesus Christ, the Logos, who is the living, incarnate, eternal Word of God. The Logos took on human flesh and made his home among us. Through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, God lived among his people. His name is Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Jesus Christ became the new earthly temple of God. The complete image of the invisible God is revealed in Jesus, our Savior. Yet Christ is only the initial installment of God's indwelling presence. Paul also taught the Ephesians, which in chapter 2 that, as members of God's household, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Just as the temple of God in the Old Covenant had three courts, the temple of God today 
which is you and I as the body of Christ, has three courts. We have the body, soul, and spirit. As the presence of God dwelt in the Holy of Holies in the Old Covenant, it still dwells in the Holy of Holies today. Your spirit is where God dwells. We must understand this. Jesus was out walking and passed by the temple of God in Jerusalem. He noticed that merchants and traders, buyers and sellers were selling in the temple courts. Jesus was angered and took leather cords. He literally made a whip to drive the animals and traders out. They were in the outer courts of the temple. Defilement was happening in the outer court, but the Holy of Holies was intact. That is to show you that there can be defilement in the temple of God, yet the Spirit of God in that temple is unaffected. Efforts in Rebuilding the Temple In the late 1960s, the organizer named the Temple Mount Faithful, the full name is the Temple Mount and Land of Israel Faithful, was established to rebuild the temple. Its leader, Gershon Salomon, is a descendant of Rabbi Avraham Shlomo Zalman Zoref, who in the early 1800s was one of the pioneers of the modern movement to prepare for the rebuilding of the temple. Zoref even sent one of his sons overseas to locate the ten lost tribes of Israel. But the rabbi's life was cut short when he was assassinated by Arabs. The great-grandson Salomon is a military officer, who has fought in most of Israel's modern wars, beginning with the War of Independence. During a battle in 1958 on the Golan Heights, a battle in which his company of 120 Israeli soldiers was ambushed by thousands of Syrians, Salomon was run over by a tank and seriously injured. He claims he actually died. When the Syrians were about to shoot him to make sure he was dead, they suddenly ran away, leaving the battlefield in the hands of the little company of Israelis. The Syrians later reported to UN officers that they had seen thousands of angels around Salomon. He says that during that experience, he saw the light of God and he knew he still had work to do, which was the rebuilding of the temple and the preparation of the coming of Messiah Ben David. Salomon was one of the soldiers that liberated the Temple Mount in 1967. Since 1989, the Temple Mount faithful has been trying to place a large stone on the Temple Mount as the cornerstone of the Third Temple. The first stone was stolen and was replaced in 2001 by two stones. Each year, they parade the stones through Jerusalem on a truck to stir up support for their objective. In 1986, the Temple Institute was founded with the goal to see Israel rebuild the Holy Temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Like the Temple Mount Faithful, but with competing plans, the Institute is preparing articles to be used in the new temple. At much expense, over $20 million, and based on extensive research, they have fashioned priestly garments the high priest's golden crown costing $30,000, the high priest's breastplate with its 12 precious stones inscribed with the names of the tribes of Israel, a copper laver, an incense altar, silver trumpets, gold and silver-plated shofars, harps, and many other things. Of special interest is the large menorah that has been fashioned from 95 pounds of pure gold valued at two million dollars in 2007 the menorah was moved to an outside location on the western wall plaza across from the temple mount prior to that it had stood in the old roman cardo the plan is to move the menorah ever closer to the temple mount itself and ultimately to place it in the third temple the temple institute compared the 2007 dedication of the menorah in its new location to the dedication of the Arch of Titus in Rome 1,900 years ago. Then the menorah was moving away from the temple, whereas today it is moving back toward the temple. 
The Temple Institute is constructing a full-scale model of the temple, covering 269,000 square feet near the Dead Sea to use for training priests. Both the Temple Mount Faithful and the Temple Institute have received support from Christians, for they looked forward to the return of the Temple, a Messiah that will come when things look dark. In an interview, a Reformed Jewish rabbi told that the Messiah will come when things look really dark and will establish peace. He said, Jerusalem is to be whole, and when the Messiah comes, the Temple will be returned to us. But that can't happen until there is eternal peace. Ultimately, we have to go deeper into destruction before we come out into the light and until God redeems not only the Jewish people, but also the rest of the world. Peace has to come. But peace can only come when things get really dark. Then Elijah will come and announce the coming of the Messiah and the Messiah will come from the Mount of Olives directly to the Temple Mount and will proclaim that the time has come for the rebuilding of the Third Temple. When the time comes for the Temple to be built, God will allow it to happen. The Third Temple will be used to honor God. Thus, the believers are looking for a Messiah that will bring peace, that will solve their problems that will help them to rebuild the temple, that will allow them to follow their tradition on equal footing with the scripture, and that will not rebuke them as sinners, but will help them follow their positive inclinations. Yes, God is everywhere. And when we realize that God is everywhere, then we don't need temples, because every place is a temple. But in the opinion of some Christians, they still desire a temple because they need temples to realize that God is everywhere. Religion and temples cannot make them realize God, but without them, they cannot attain that state of spiritual awakening to realize that God is in every molecule. God is in every soul. God is everywhere. God is in everything. The challenge that God poses now when building the temple is due to his will. Everything will be difficult, but will go smoothly soon. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.